Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone, this is the third and final part of this module. This is lecture 58 of module 11. So in the last lecture of module uh, 11, uh, we are going to take a look at two other groups of bacteria. The first one is iron oxidizing bacteria and the second one is uh, the group of bacteria that are involved in the nitrogen cycle. Uh, we now come to another group of bacteria which is called iron oxidizing bacteria. Now these iron oxidizing bacteria can be either aerobic or facultative and you can refer to the text, uh, the Brock text uh, figure 19.33. Uh, what you see over here in this slide is acid mine drainage. Now acid mine drainage comes out of these uh, mining operations and it tends to have extremely low pH. So very often you will find that uh, acid mine drainage has pH around 2 or even lower than that. Okay. Now um, in general uh, this kind of drainage has very high iron content and we are used to thinking that in the normal conditions around us when the pH of water is close to neutral, it's close to 7, under those conditions any iron that is present in the water gets spontaneously oxidized to, uh, first to elemental iron will get converted to Fe2 ferrous iron and uh, Fe2 plus will get converted to Fe3 plus which is ferric iron. So this happens spontaneously at neutral pH. Now acid mine drainage is a whole different uh, story because we have pH that is close to 2. It's no longer a spontaneous chemical reaction. Instead, it is a biologically mediated reaction and this um, particular reaction cannot be mediated by any bacteria. There are specific species of bacteria in this example that is shown. It's thiobacillus ferrooxidans and that is responsible for oxidizing Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. So this graphic shows us a conceptual way of uh, showing us that the oxidation of ferrous iron to ferric iron is uh, spontaneous only under neutral conditions. So you can see these two lines which show the decreasing ferrous iron concentration under neutral pH. Whether the bacteria are present or not present, it doesn't matter. It's a spontaneous chemical reaction. Under acidic conditions, you can see under sterile conditions, there is no change in the concentration of ferrous iron. It is only when uh, bacteria are present under acidic conditions, only then is ferrous iron oxidized to ferric iron. So this is a very interesting example. It's a very interesting example of a particular uh, group of bacteria which is capable of oxidizing iron under acidic conditions. So by definition, these bacteria are acidophilic bacteria. And like I said, they can be aerobic as well as facultative. There have been uh, several reports in the literature, which I will come to in a little bit. The iron, uh, I'm sorry, the electron donor in these reactions is ferrous iron and it's converted to ferric iron and the electron acceptor is oxygen. So it remains, um, it's an autotrophic reaction. So here we have um, a review paper which talks about uh, acid mine drainage and the microbes that are associated with acid mine drainage. So there is a whole uh, long list of acidophilic and acidophilic bacteria that have been identified in acid mine drainage in various sites around the world. 
Uh, most of them are in Wales and uh, one in Spain, one in the US. And what you see is that all of these black boxes indicate the bacteria that were isolated from the acid mine drainage water from the site itself. Um, the striped boxes are based on molecular methods. The gray boxes include both um, identification of individual species as well as molecular methods used for uh, identification. And the empty boxes indicate there was no detection of those particular groups of uh, microorganisms. So you can see uh, a large number of microorganisms uh, that are iron oxidizing bacteria. So you can see their concentrations listed in the table. Other than the first site, all of them have extremely low pH. So you have pH of 3.4, 2.7, 2.5, 2.7 and less than 1. So these are all um, examples and there are both autotrophic as well as heterotrophic bacteria and the concentrations of these bacteria are not very high. They are slightly less than 10 to the power 2 which is the detection limit of um, many of these methods I think and you also have uh, 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 4, 5 in one case. So these are some of the uh, iron oxidizing bacteria that have been identified in acid mine drainage. Here are more examples of the colonies of acidophilic iron oxidizing uh, bacteria isolated from another mining site in Germany. So these are just examples of the same and uh, this is also an example of how iron is recycled in nature uh, based on both chemical as well as microbial oxidation. So we know that under neutral pH conditions um, elemental iron will be converted to Fe2 and then to Fe3 in the presence of oxygen. That's what rust is all about. So whenever you have any metal containing iron around you, you know that it gets converted to um, Fe2 and then Fe3. Now Fe2 is fairly soluble compared to Fe3. Fe3 is more or less insoluble. It forms dark black precipitates and uh, that is generally uh, insoluble. That We consider that almost insoluble. Yeah. Uh, so these are the Fe3 oxides. Microbial reduction will bring them back to Fe2 and elemental iron and the oxidation that I just showed you is also possible. So this is how iron is uh, recycled literally within the uh, environment by microbes. All of it is by microbes. And uh, you can also have an oxygenic phototrophic uh, iron oxidizing bacteria. So uh, all of them do exist in the environment. Let us now look at another element. The next element is nitrogen. Now nitrogen is very interesting because it comes in several different forms. Uh, you have different oxidation states for nitrogen. It exists in many different oxidation states. So you have inert nitrogen gas in the atmosphere that is not bioavailable and you have ammonia, nitrite and nitrate along with organic nitrogen which is available, which is bioavailable form. Uh, these are all bioavailable forms of nitrogen. Okay. So we are going to look at two major processes associated with nitrogen. One is nitrification and the other is anamox. Both of these groups of microbes that are involved in nitrification and anamox are autotrophic bacteria. So let's take, uh, let's start with nitrification. So we have strictly aerobic autotrophic bacteria that are involved in the nitrification process. What is nitrification? Let's first look at that and then some of the species that are involved in this process. So the first thing to remember is that nitrification uh, is the conversion of ammonia, inorganic ammonia to nitrite and nitrate. Where is the inorganic ammonia coming from? It's basically coming from um, organic amino uh, amines or amino acids and so on. So 
uh, when you think about wastewater, one of the biggest things that wastewater contains is organic nitrogen. So, this is shown as RNH4. So, this RNH4 is organic nitrogen. The first thing that happens is that it becomes ammonia, free ammonia. And this free ammonia is then converted by oxidation to nitrite and nitrate. And that is what we are going to look at over here. Now, this ammonia conversion to nitrite and nitrate is mediated by nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. So, these are specific species of aerobic autotrophic bacteria that are responsible for oxidizing ammonia to nitrite and nitrate. And the first step, nitrosomonas is the species that will oxidize ammonia to nitrite. In this case, this itself, this one step process which we generally talk about as ammonia to nitrite is actually a two step process. Ammonia is first converted to hydroxylamine, so that is NH2OH by a particular enzyme ammonia monoxygenase which is uh, present only in nitrosomonas species. That is the first step. This hydroxylamine is then converted by another enzyme hydroxylamine oxidoreductase in the second step. So, the first step is shown over here ammonia plus oxygen plus two protons plus two electrons will go to hydroxylamine. This hydroxylamine is then converted by the hydroxylamine oxidoreductase enzyme to nitrite. So, that is the first thing. Then we come to nitrite. Nitrite has to be converted to nitrate and that is done by nitrobacter. So, this second step in the entire conversion of ammonia to ammonia being the most reduced form of nitrogen and nitrate being the most oxidized form of nitrogen, that is the entire uh, gamut of um, the nitrogen species, so to speak. And uh, the next step is mediated by nitrite oxidoreductase enzyme. Okay. Now, these nitrifying bacteria together are responsible for completing the complete oxidation of nitrogen containing um, compounds. So, these nitrifying bacteria are present in soil, in water and several other environments. They generally have very low growth yields which is typical of autotrophic bacteria because autotrophic bacteria do not rely on organic carbon. They are relying on CO2 as their carbon source. So, generally their growth yields are very low. And because of that, their energy yields as usual. I've shown you a correlation between energy and the uh, biomass. So, that is typical. Okay. Now, in many cases, uh, it has been observed that these autotrophic bacteria can switch to heterotrophy if organic substrates like glucose are available. That's one uh, point that has been mentioned in the textbook. And another thing that has been mentioned in the textbook is that ammonia oxidizing bacteria, these two species are part of the, uh, out of the three domains, bacteria, archaea and eukarya, out of those three domains, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter are part of bacteria, which means they are modern bacteria. One species of ammonia oxidizing archaea bacteria has been found in marine environments and it is very similar in its mechanism of utilizing ammonia. Uh, it's very similar to nitrosomonas. Okay? And the archaea bacteria is nitrosopumulus and that's something that seems to have been found recently. Uh, having discussed nitrification in terms of the individual bacterial species that are involved in uh, converting one nitrogen species to another, let us also take a holistic view of how it happens in the environment, in the natural environment. So, this is a very simple and um, very uh, interesting example of how nitrogen species in rivers or streams are converted from one form to another. So, let us take a look at this river or a stream and 
let's imagine that there is a single point source discharge of sewage or wastewater municipal wastewater now municipal wastewater has a very high concentration of organic nitrogen this organic nitrogen in the beginning is almost the entire uh, nitrogen that's coming in wastewater is in the form of organic nitrogen there may be a little bit ammonia as well so this organic nitrogen is going to decline rapidly in terms of its concentration as the water flows from the point at which it, the wastewater has been released and as it mixes with the river water and flows further away from the point of release. Now this organic nitrogen is going to be first converted to free ammonia. So here we have ammonium ions. Um, now I need to clarify one point and that is that when you have organic nitrogen it can be converted to ammonium or ammonia. So those are the two, you know, the first two inorganic forms that are formed when organic nitrogen is converted by the process of ammonification to two forms and given the pH of most natural waters they are around 6.5 to 8, 8.5 in that range you are going to find ammonium so NH4 plus but if the pH were higher then NH3 would also exist and there is both of them coexist but the dominant species tends to be ammonium ion and ammonia gas is also present and it can off gas and that's what we smell. So uh, that all that happens in the process of ammonification where organic nitrogen is converted to either ammonia or ammonium ions. And this free ammonia will then be converted to nitrite. You can see uh, two um, curves that show you the increase and then the subsequent decrease. So the first increase followed by a subsequent decrease is indicative of the fact that organic nitrogen is first being converted to ammonia. This ammonia is being converted to nitrite and nitrate by uh, bacterial species nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. So you can see this peak. The peak is indicative of the fact that there is an ex, um, rapid release of free ammonia which is then picked up by the nitrifying bacteria and these nitrifying bacteria are relatively slow growers and these nitrite uh, forming bacteria will then this nitrite will be converted to nitrate and that is the most oxidized form of nitrogen so there is no further a change in the oxidation state of nitrogen so you get complete conversion of organic nitrogen to nitrate in a flowing stream and you can look at the x-axis in terms of distance from the point of discharge or you can take a uh, you can look at it as time where time if you know the velocity of the water in the river then you can convert time and distance based on the flow velocity of the water. Let me also show you what happens in an actual situation. So the previous slide is about a hypothetical situation just to illustrate this conversion of organic nitrogen to nitrate in a series of um, with a series of intermediate uh, nitrogen species. This is actual data from a, a project that we did and here what you see is the concentration of the three major nitrogen species ammonium, uh, ammonium ion, nitrite and nitrate along the river Hooghly and th this data was collected in 2012-13 it's been published in a paper and uh, what it shows us is the same rise and fall but this rise and fall in the concentration is a function of the multiple point and non-point discharges of wastewater. So if you think about any river that flows by a large city, what you will find is that there are multiple nalas, drains, uh, etc. that are discharging either treated or untreated wastewater into these rivers. This is the same story with uh, Hooghly River. And they also, so those are the point uh, discharges. We also have surface runoff from the land area coming into the river. So that is non-point discharges. In this kind of complex situation, what is the situation with respect to the nitrogen 
species. So ammonia nitrogen, you can see this is the north end from where we started sampling and the area above distance zero is agricultural area. So it's mostly uh, villages with fields and so on and uh, from 0 to 22 is the length of the river that passes through the two cities of Howrah on one side and uh, Kolkata on the other side. Okay, So initially our ammonium concentration was 0. There was a rapid increase, a decline, it went on, the decline went on all the way until the south end of the uh, river, the part of the river that we were sampling. And there was a temporary increase followed by a decline again. Now, as I said, the increase and the decrease, this is indicative of the fact that uh, ammonia is being released, ammonium or ammonia are being released, it all depends on the pH. Um, these two forms of ammonia are going to be present in water when you have discharges of organic nitrogen. And organic nitrogen can be discharged mainly from municipal sewage. So that is the biggest one and that is very clear in this case. Ammonium or ammonia are converted to nitrite and nitrate by nitrif nitrifying bacteria. So these nitrite uh, forming bacteria are present. You can see the nitrite peak is coming up much later and I have already mentioned that nitrifying bacteria are slow growers. So the peak is formed far after the peak for ammonia is formed and there is no further production of nitrite because this nitrite is being converted to nitrite, uh, nitrate. So here you can see for nitrate. Now nitrate is a very interesting case on this particular graph because you have a fairly high nitrate concentration to begin with. Now if nitrate were coming only from municipal wastewater discharges then it should have been zero but it's not and that is indicative of the fact that the fertilizer, the uh, fertilizer application to the fields north of these two cities has probably contributed to the high level of nitrate right in the beginning. That has declined probably by sedimentation and precipitation and so on and there is another peak followed by the ammonia peak. Long after the ammonia peak you see a peak in nitrate and that corresponds also to the peak in nitrite. So this is again an indicator of the fact that ammonium has been converted to nitrite and nitrate. And these, uh, then you see a further decline in nitrate concentrations. Again, I am uh, speculating that most of this nitrate may be either part of biomass uptake or sedimentation and precipitation. So these are possible processes for which, by which nitrate would have sunk or lost from in terms of the concentration. So, and then you see another peak at the end towards the southern end. Uh, there was a large amount of um, wastewater discharged at the southern end and uh, the nitrate peak may be another one associated with uh, these ammonia concentrations as well as with uh, nitrite concentrations. It's not very clear. This one is not very clear, but the first two uh, this set of data is very clear. Then we come to Anamox. What is Anamox? Anamox is a very interesting way of oxidizing ammonia in the absence of oxygen. So in nitrification we are utilizing oxygen but in this case what happens is that ammonium that so your organic nitrogen has been converted to ammonium form and this ammonium along with nitrite will result in the formation of inert nitrogen gas along with water. Now this from an agricultural perspective is definitely not a desirable reaction. However, this is a very important part of the biogeochemical cycle about nitrogen because it completely, uh, it basically um, <laughs> it basically results from the combination of a reduced um, uh, nitrogen species and an oxidized nitrogen species and 
puts nitrogen back in the atmosphere. So this is a very important uh, point and you can see that the delta G0 dash for this reaction is fairly high. So uh, these anamox bacteria are capable not just of surviving but of thriving in an environment where ammonia and nitrite are in plenty and the best example of that environment is uh, municipal sewage or wastewater. So you generally have lots of ammonia and lots of nitrite in these environments. So nitrite in the above reaction can be obtained from aerobic nitrifying bacteria. There is a symbiotic relationship between nitrosomonas and brocadia in these ammonia rich habitats like sewage and wastewater. Um, Anamox activity is considered to be governed by the oxygen levels in the environment even though they are obligately anaerobic even then uh, their activity level they themselves will not use oxygen but uh, the activity level is governed by the availability or the presence of oxygen in their environment. Um, I have mentioned here that the carbon fixation mechanism is still unclear. It's possible that there are publications, more recent publications with um, some amount of um, um, information about this particular mechanism. And another major application for this uh, type of bacteria, the anamox bacteria is that it can be used for the removal of ammonia and amines and sending nitrogen back into the atmosphere in inert form. So this is uh, something that people have been working on in the last few years uh, to quite a large extent. There's been quite a few uh, publications in this area. Uh, so let's come to dissimilative nitrate reduction and denitrification. In this particular process, nitrate is being converted to nitrite and other gaseous products. So that is what I have shown over here. So here we have the nitrogen cycle in terms of different oxidation states of nitrogen. So we have ammonia, it can be oxidized in the presence of oxygen to nitrite and nitrate. All these forms are considered bioavailable forms of nitrogen and these bioavailable forms can be taken up into the organic biomass and this is what we call assimilatory nitrogen reduction. So the uh, oxidation state of nitrogen comes down when it becomes part of the organic material and that is also called ammonification because basically nitrogen in organic form is amines that is the main form. So here we have our NH4. Now there is dissimilatory nitrogen reduction which is what we are going to look at. So we have nitrate going to nitrite and back to ammonia. This nitrite can also be converted under anaerobic conditions to nitrogen oxide, dinitrogen oxide and inert nitrogen gas and all these are gaseous end products which go back into the atmosphere and that is why it is called dissimilatory nitrogen reduction. So nitrate in this case is converted to nitrite and other gaseous products. Now denitrification for the removal of nitrate happens it can be used for treating contaminated groundwater. Uh, some of you may be aware of the fact that nitrate is applied in high amounts to fields mainly for agricultural purposes because after all it is a essential plant nutrient and this excessive use of uh, fertilizer results in the contamination of groundwater because the excessive nitrate that is present in the fields and the soil will uh, percolate into the groundwater systems and result in high nitrate concentrations. Nitrate by itself is not toxic but infants who are less than six months old can have a problem um, because nitrate can get converted to nitrite. Nitrite has a greater affinity for hemoglobin compared to oxygen. So these uh, children do not have the crucial enzyme that is required for uh, preventing this reaction and because of the higher affinity of nitrite to hemoglobin it results in what is called methemoglobinemia or the blue baby syndrome and this causes the child to 
uh, suffer from a lack of oxygen and it can cause death by suffocation. Denitrification processes are detrimental for agriculture because you have a loss of bioavailable nitrogen. And I'll just go back to the previous slide. These are these four or these four forms are the bioavailable forms of nitrogen. The other three forms are not bioavailable nitrogen. So they are lost from the system. And when you lose bioavailable nitrogen, then your fertilizer requirement increases. So this is a very delicate balance to maintain from an agricultural point of view. And it can be, uh, it requires a good amount of management. Then we come to nitrogen fixation. I've already mentioned that inert nitrogen gas, which is abundant in our atmosphere, is not bioavailable. And for agricultural productivity, for primary productivity on the planet, it is essential to convert this gas to bioavailable forms. So, uh, the bioavailable forms are limited. And if you remember what I said about limiting nutrient, often the limiting nutrient for uh, the growth or primary productivity of any ecosystem is because of either nitrogen or phosphorus. These are the two most common limiting nutrients in the environment. And you can have aerobic as well as anaerobic bacteria that are capable of fixing nitrogen. You can also have symbiotic bacteria that fix nitrogen only when they are associated with certain plants. So soya beans, alfalfa, leguminous as well as non-leguminous plants are known to have symbiotic relationships with nitrogen fixing bacteria. Only prokaryotic or bacterial species have this ability. We do, as of now, no eukaryotes have been found with a similar ability. Nitrogen can be converted to ammonia ammonium and then to or organic nitrogen. So you have high energy in the triple bond uh, that's available. So uh, in this slide and in the next I have quite a few examples from the textbook of different types of species that are responsible for nitrogen fixation. So we have some free living aerobic species of bacteria and within them we have chemoorganotrophs, we have phototrophs and chemolithotrophs. Now within the chemoorganotrophs, they are all belonging to the bacteria, spe uh, bacteria domain of the um, classification of organisms. So here we have Azotobacter, Azo Azomonas and Klebsiella. Now Klebsiella is known to be capable of nitrogen fixation only under anoxic conditions. Under oxic, it's a facultative bacteria. Under oxic conditions, it's a completely aerobic, um, I think heterotrophic bacteria. It doesn't even go into the nitrogen fixing um, mechanism. So that happens only under anoxic conditions. That's, some, that's something that's very peculiar about Klebsiella. Other examples are Acetobacter diazotrophicus, uh, Bajarenchia, uh, Bacillus, Polymyxia, Mycobacterium, Azospiralum, Citrobacter, uh, Citrobacter, Methylomonas, uh, and Methylococcus. So these are some of the uh, chemoorganotrophs. Then you have phototrophs, cyanobacteria. Many of the cyanobacteria are capable of nitrogen fixation. Uh, we have chemolithotrophs like alkali genes, we have thiobacillus and streptomyces, all of them are chemolithotrophs. Now, so we have nitrogen fixing bacteria that have, um, uh, that are capable of uh, having symbiotic relations with either leguminous plants or non-leguminous plants. And uh, a few examples were mentioned in the previous slide and there are a few others here. So you have bacteria of the genus Rhizobium, Bradyrhizobium, Cyanorhizobium or Azorhizobium. All of these rhizobacteria are capable of fixing nitrogen in association with plants like soya beans, peas, clover and so on. There are non-leguminous plants as well, Alnus, um, Myrica, um, Casuarina, all of them in association with actinomycetes of the genus Frankia can be used for nitrogen fixation. 
there are some examples of free living anaerobic nitrogen fixing bacteria here. So again in the three groups of chemoorganotrophs, phototrophs, chemolithotrophs we have Clostridium, Desulfovibrio, uh, in the phototrophs we have so many other species Chromatium, Chlorobium, Rhodospirulum and in the chemolithotrophic group these are all archaea bacteria, so methanosarcina, methanococcus, methanobacterium, they are all capable of nitrogen fixation. Thank you and that's the end of this particular part.